Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and then this redgamingtech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which as usual has popped up for the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with the Switch Mini. There's a report which originated from Forbes.com that the Switch Mini will actually be more powerful than the console which debuted back in 2017. The Switch Mini has numerous changes, at least what have been rumoured, including the fact that the Joy-Cons are now essentially part of the case itself. But this report also details that the screen itself will increase in resolution. It will now be a 1080p native display, and the actual GPU and inside and internal components uh, for the system will also be beefed up to accommodate this. Now, there is definitely some confusion uh, regarding what we will see from the Switch Mini and whether it will still be uh, possible to plug it into your television. Forbes also alleges that the manufacturing process is two generations improved compared to the original Switch as well, which should lead to much better battery life. It'll be interesting to see exactly what happens with this because Nintendo currently are stating that they're not going to comment on rumors because they feel that it could provide spoilers and also could potentially hurt their profits. So it's neither a confirmation nor a denial from the company, which is pretty much their standard uh, modus operandi. Personally speaking, I think it's all but confirmed that we will see a Switch Mini. After all, we've seen so many leaks over the past several weeks alone. But whether it's going to be a more powerful device remains questionable. The increase in screen resolution for a portable system is also interesting. Now, I'm not referring, of course, here to the device being more powerful for when you plug it into your 1080p or 4K television. But the fact that they're actually increasing the resolution on a screen which presumably is going to be smaller and denser is definitely an interesting decision. Although with so many rumors that we're going to be seeing uh, Microsoft bringing streaming to the Switch with the uh, xCloud and of course Netflix as well being bought to the Switch, perhaps that's also one of uh, the selling points for the uh, Switch Mini as well, just increasing the resolution because let's face it, marketing the screen as having a 1080p display, uh, sorry, being 1080p capable, uh, would possibly also help to convince uh, buyers to grab the system. One of the biggest events in technology has recently occurred, and that is AMD have launched the Ryzen 3000 series CPUs, happened just a few days ago, and they are selling extremely well. But Intel are going to be countering with Comet Lake, which will bring the core count for their mainstream CPUs up to 10 cores, 20 threads. And almost to the minute after we saw see the launch of AMD's CPUs, a product listing for Intel's 10th generation processors has emerged online, and it's currently just being shared rather virally. So I want to actually discuss this uh, this. Uh, leaked product listing because I think it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, I'm pretty certain that it's fake for reasons that we'll go into in just a moment. But while I think that it's not uh, something that Intel themselves have created and I think it's just uh, a fake, uh, you know, standard internet fake, I do feel that it's possibly quite close to what we might see from Intel with a few exceptions. But let's have a look at the specifications and then we'll go through why it's fake. So the lowest end SKU is the i3-10100 with a base frequency of 3.7 GHz and a turbo frequency for single core performance of 4.4 GHz and all cores it runs at 4.2 GHz and has a TDP of 65 watts, 4 cores, 8 threads. According to the smart cache amount though, this is the first iRaiser seven megabytes but we'll get further into that in just a moment i want you to take a look though at all of the uh, thread counts and core counts yep that's right all of the cpus here have simultaneous multi-threading or i'm sure intel would much prefer i use the term hyper threading technology and i feel that that's a very good possibility for intel's next generation parts after all i don't think they have the luxury now of being like well you know, you're only buying a 9700K, for example, so no, no hyper-threading for you. I feel that now they're going to segment their products a lot more like we're seeing here, either with clock frequencies or core counts, uh, different uh, 
memory support, that type of thing. I don't think that they're going to just be like, well, we're just going to cut the number of threads you have just because. Uh, I just don't think it's going to work like that. It doesn't really cost them that much more to implement hyper-threading, and that's putting it mildly. So I think just because AMD now have that through their entire product stack, it just makes a great deal of sense for Intel to do the same. Switching things to the highest end SKU, which is right at the bottom, of course, we have the 10900 KF, and it is running at 4.6 gigahertz or processor cores, 10 cores, 20 threads, 105 watts. And the smart cache here is 20 megabytes, and it supports two channel DDR4 memory at 3200 megahertz. Notice the pricing is 499 bucks, and the processor right above that, the, the uh, 10900. Uh, uh, F is also quite similar but slightly slightly lower clock frequencies but obviously it is not a K part so we have slightly uh, so we have inferior overclocking excuse me but it's also considerably cheaper 50 US dollars cheaper the i7 10700k which is a couple of products above that uh, 3.6 gigahertz as the base frequency 5.1 gigahertz for the single core turbo frequency but 4.8 for all cores and this is basically a replacement for the current 9900k it's eight cores 16 threads 95 watts 16 megabytes of uh, cache and uh, also supports two channel ddr4 at 3200 megahertz for the sake of this discussion i'm going to admit uh, any reference to the Intel UHD 730 graphics chip. So, why do I feel that this is fake, but why do I feel that it might turn out to be fairly accurate? Well, ultimately it comes down to the cache sizes on a couple of the chips, the most obvious suspect being the 10100. Uh, 7 megabytes of level 3 cache doesn't really make sense there, just because of how uh, cache is usually... Uh, divided up in Intel CPUs so I mean it's possible that they've radically changed something but I highly doubt it the other thing that makes me very suspicious is the way that they are discussing the pricing if you cast your eyes all the way over to the right you'll notice that in the case of for example the 10900 KF it says 499 and then it has the US dollar pricing which once again, is contrary to how Intel normally does this stuff. Normally, it will be the US dollar price first. Also, and this one is based upon rumor, not uh, something that we can kind of 100% say for certain, but the highest uh, TDP processor there is the, uh, well, the, the 900KF. And it is listed as 105 watts from what I've been told from a couple of different sources, along with what we've uh, heard on the internet in general. So a couple of people have been discussing this with me on Twitter. So that's multiple people uh, who all have heard the same thing. It's 125 watts, although that is only an engineering sample. So possibly Intel are measuring things different now, or possibly they're just like, hmm... We don't really want to have a 125 watt CPU just for marketing purposes, so maybe that's one of the reasons. Who knows? But the other thing is that these processors are not actually running with the uh, number of pins in the socket from what we've heard from quite reliable sources. So if you look at the uh, socket support, it is 1159. Now I can tell you Several people have told me that the uh, Comet Lake CPUs will be on a different motherboard platform, but that is actually for a good reason. Basically, you need more energies to run the cores, at least in the case of Intel. So they just don't feel that the current socket is capable of delivering that. Therefore, the 400 series boards, which we've seen uh, leak, apparently has 1200 pins. And there's been a couple of uh, sources who have posted that online. 
So 1200 is obviously more than 1159. With that said though, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a product lineup that looked kind of similar to this, particularly with Hyperthreading. Although, and this is not someone at Intel or a source that's told me this, but if I were Intel, I would certainly consider it. And that is that I would heavily push overclocking for the 10th generation Comet Lake CPUs. One weakness, if you want to call it that, for the uh, Ryzen 3000 series, this is not much room for manual overclocking. Indeed, Robert Halleck from AMD has recently confirmed that when it comes to what's left in the tank for manual tweaking, there's not an awful lot there. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because it basically means that the CPUs do a pretty good job of hitting the red line themselves, but some people just want to tweak things and really get the most out of a value processor. Now, I'm not saying that the 3600, for example, is poor value, because, well, that would be total rubbish. With that said, though, Intel can have a quite easy marketing win here by simply unlocking more of its SKUs. And there have been some really great examples of this in the past from Intel with really cheap processors and just allowing you to overclock the actual heck out of them. So for Intel to do this again, it might be a great way for them to snag lower end processor cells as well as the higher end processor cells and also simplify their lineup a bit. So basically what I'm saying is that not all of the CPUs, but a good portion of them should simply be multiply unlocked. And I'd also like to see the majority of their lineup have hyper-threading as well. There is also a lot of discussion, of course, with the security ramifications of that and what we're going to see actually implemented and tweaked in terms of security uh, for uh, Comet Lake when it finally comes out. So basically what I'm saying is that from multiple people that I've spoken to, there will be a clock frequency increase for Comet Lake. Who knows what that actually is going to be? Is it going to be as ambitious as this? Well, honestly, I am hoping so, because if Intel can charge a similar amount of cash that AMD are charging for the 3900, but for a 10-core CPU, which has a, a higher clock frequency than what we have for the 9900K, there are definitely going to be some usage scenarios that I suspect that the 10-core uh, CPU from Intel, whatever it ends up being called, let's call it the 10900 for the sake of this video, uh, will definitely win out. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this happens, because unfortunately for Intel, we do know that for desktop 10nm parts, we're going to have to wait some, which de definitely means that uh, Sunny Cove, which is of course the new architecture from the company, it's unfortunately it's delayed because Sunny Cove does look incredibly promising. The IPC gains for that are very impressive, but it's when they can actually execute and bring it to desktop. And finally, I'd like to discuss something that Jay's Two Cents recently brought up in his review of the RX 5700. A couple of you actually emailed me about this, so I'm going to link his uh, review in the description of this review because it's only fair. But basically, in his review of the RX 5700 and 5700 XT, he said that he d was discussing things with AMD and what their future plans were for GPUs. He was basically trying to wrangle out of them whether we're going to see higher-end SKUs in the 5000 series. So, for example, whether we're going to see like a 5800 or whatever. And obviously, they gave you the answer that you would expect no comment, which isn't really surprising. We do know that their roadmap does show a next generation GPU and we've always and we've all seen the various uh, uh, filings and patents for uh, brands and names for higher end SKUs, but that could just be a patent and doesn't actually equate to a product that is going to launch. But what is new information is that he said that AMD want you to think of the RDNA architecture much more like how you thought of the original Zen architecture. To them, RDNA is much more like a brand new start. So obviously when Zen first launched, it wasn't perfect. It had some issues, the clock frequency, some latency between caches and blah, 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 blah. But in general, it was a massive improvement in performance and IPC compared to the previous architectures. 
And AMD believe in this instance that RDNA compared to let's say Vega or Polaris, which were its predecessors, is the same. So basically it's an architecture that they're gonna build upon and build upon and build upon with every subsequent architecture release. And I think that's quite interesting because it does show uh, that they have a lot of confidence for the roadmap going forward and it's not gonna be like a dead end. They basically know that they are gonna be bringing a lot more features to the table and performance increases. And I think that this is pretty obvious from the verbiage that they've used uh, and the roadmaps, plus as well, a couple of comments when they were discussing the next generation consoles, particularly Microsoft, uh, they mentioned next generation RDNA, which at least to me implies that the next generation console, that is Xbox, is gonna be using a new variant of RDNA and not the version that we currently have for desktops. So it's gonna be very curious to see what AMD can bring to the table, whether we're gonna see improvements in heat and uh, possibly higher clock frequencies or just increases number in sh of uh, shaders and other just architectural tweaks in general, plus, well, we know there's going to be some type of hybrid ray tracing as well, but I think that this will change over the next couple of years, and this is going to be particularly of importance when Intel jump into the fray next year. With all of that said, though, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.